Well, good morning, everyone. I hope you've enjoyed our morning as much as I have. I know we are not the point of worship, but sometimes worship uh, does a lot for the worshiper, and I appreciate Jacob's efforts this morning. I appreciate Ron's prayer. Uh, Julian's going to have to come for closing prayer because you had the first one and you had the second one, so, I mean, you got to phone it in or something, but <laughs> we'll figure it out. If you have your Bible, I'd encourage you to please go back to First John. I want to begin with you there again in 1 John 1, verse 5. Six times, at least in the New American Standard Version, the word if is used in that section. It's a series of conditional or, or logical statements. If this, then that. Or if not this, then not that. How, however it's worded. This, then that. Or if not this, then not that. How, however it's worded. What does stand out in that section there are a couple of times where that doesn't happen. And really the beginning of the section in one five, is where the sort of chapter or where the segment of this section really sort of centers around. It begins in 1 John 1.5. This is the message. Now the message he's talking about is the one he was talking about in the first four verses. We talked a little bit last month about how John and others were a part of a group of men that walked and talked and listened to and, and watched Jesus do what he did. They were literally with him in the physical, tangible sense. They saw and heard the things that he did and said. And it's that message in 1 and verse 4 that he's writing to them about. And so when we begin in 1 5, this is really the, the first big chunk of, of teaching here. This is the message We've heard from him and announced to you that God is light and in him is no darkness or in him there is no darkness at all, it says. This first sentence seems to carry with it the, the foundational truth upon which the rest of it depends. Something about God being light flavors the rest of this passage. Because the rest of the passage is a bunch of if this, then that statements. So whatever comes first kind of is the way by which we have to think about everything that follows. Plus, there's the question of why would John have to tell them that God is light? Shouldn't they know that? Why does that matter so much? In the statements that follow, they alternate between positives and negatives, starting with the negatives. You always want to start with the bad news first, correct? Correct. If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, then, or not there, we lie to ourselves, or we lie and do not practice the truth. If we say we have fellowship with this God while we walk in darkness, we're telling ourselves a lie. If, down a little further, if we say that we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves the truth not in us. Ever so slightly different a little further along. It sounds kind of like the same phrase, but it's not quite. The first one or the second one says, if we say that we have no sin. And the second one says, if we say that we have not sinned. Again, the truth is not in us. This portion of scripture deals with some falsehoods that people say to themselves and say to others. And perhaps they believe these things and they need to be set right. John gives us the alternative in each case. If is the negative, and he comes back with its contrast. But if we walk in the light as he himself's in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And he continues. If, or rather, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just or faithful and righteous to forgive us. There at the end, if anyone sins, we have an advocate. So you can see how this sort of goes back and forth between the two. And the only statement that doesn't fall in line with those three things is that part about the little children at the end. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. This gives us the why in our passage. Why is John in 1 verse 4 writing the things that he's writing? Why is this message so important? It's because John hopes when his readers get done reading or listening to this read to them, they will be motivated not to sin anymore. And that's my message, and that's my goal for you this morning. Would that we could read this passage, and then at the end of it, tell ourselves and commit to a life where sin is not present. 
sin's the subject. That's going to be our discussion this morning. Why is it that God being light, I'm a little ahead of myself here, why is it that God being light is the way we have to start discussions on sin? Because normally that's not how we discuss sin. We discuss sin sort of like legal, you know, the Ten Commandments, the thou shalts and mostly the thou shalt not. But we usually don't start with the why. Why is it that John begins a discussion of sin and why we must avoid it with God is light and in him is no darkness? And then we're going to go back through those same three errors in just a moment and think about how those are expressed in our world and how you see those in our culture and even in the religious culture. How misunderstandings with sin misguide people. And then what are the solutions that John presents to the sin that we've read just about in a moment ago? But first of all, God being light. I'm very happy this morning that it's sun shining because this lesson doesn't hit quite so well when it's cloudy or when it's dark outside. Okay, And you'll know why in just a second. God being light is, of course, uh, it's, a, it's a description. It's not literal. God's not a light bulb. God's not a fire. It, it, these are descriptive terms. But the idea that God being light is something that's very easy for us as humans to understand when we think about the light source that we have on earth. When we think about the sun, which, of course, this year in Indiana is going to go away in a couple of months, right? People selling the glasses everywhere. Why would you sell seats to go see something you can walk outside? Anyway, the whole other sermon. <laughs> Think about the sun for just a second as a metaphor for who God is. The sun is the source of our light. It is the source of our warmth. It is the source of all plant life and through that all animal life, or at least its sustainer in the physical sense. God is the source just as the sun is the source. The sun is not malicious. When you look closely at the sun through a telescope, hopefully not directly, there's no smiley face or frowny face or expressions at all. It's just the sun. It's not malicious towards anyone. The sun harbors no ill will towards anyone. But if you refuse to respect its power, the Effects of doing so are painful. You spend too much time in the sun without protection, protective ointment. You get sunburned. You stare directly into the sun. You lose your eyesight. You fly a spacecraft too close to the sun, and it gets annihilated. Why? Why is it when you venture too close to the sun, you're incinerated? It's because the intensity of the sun is such that it prevents anything that's not itself from being nearby. Everything that's not the sun, right next to the sun, is gone. Consider how well that describes God. God is certainly not malicious. God is described in Scripture as love, as truth, as being there is none good but God. He certainly does not hate. In the malicious sense that we do, God says that he hates sin, and that's certainly true. But God isn't looking to be mean or looking to be cruel. He does not delight in the death of sinners. And yet that does not change his nature. He is incredibly unique and separate and other, which is what the word holy means. What happens in Scripture when people fail to respect the holiness of God? When they, res fail, or when they fail to respect his different nature? The law is filled with references to Israel's education on the subject, beginning in many ways with Exodus chapter 3, the story of the burning bush. Moses walking along around Mount Sinai sees a bush that's on fire, but it's not being burned up. And like you and I would do, he turned aside to see what on earth is this. And when he reaches a certain distance from the bush, God calls out to him and he tells him, don't come any closer. Take the sandals off your feet. For the place in which you're standing is holy ground. God, Moses was allowed to approach, but not all the way. He was prevented by coming, from coming all the way to where God was, in a sense. When Israel approaches Mount Sinai in Exodus 19, the mountain in which they're going to have their first date, you might say, their first actual face-to-face -face interaction with God. Not face-to-face, -face, but you know what I mean. In Exodus 19, they're told, don't touch the mountain. 
Don't let your animals touch the mountain. And if one of them does, you kill it. You ever wonder why? Why did God tell them to kill the animal that walks on the mountain? It's because somebody's going to go try to get it. If it gets loose. And rather than risk destroying human life by his holiness, God says destroy the animal first. Even the temple, or the earlier record version of it, the tabernacle, had a room on the very interior in which no man could go. On one day of the year, the Day of Atonement, the high priest could enter the most holy place, the place where the Ark of the Covenant lay. And even before doing that, he had to go through a long series of ritualistic cleansings and washings and put on the correct clothes and make sure that he does the correct thing. Every time the high priest would emerge from that room out into the tabernacle, it was a bit of a celebration because no one was allowed to go in there. And it was an incredibly hazardous thing to do. My question for you this morning is why? Why is it Moses couldn't approach the bush? Why is it Israel couldn't touch the mountain? Why is it nobody could go into that room except for one day a year and that only under very special circumstances? The problem lay not with God. The problem's with us. Moses, for all of his good characteristics, was a murderer. The nation of Israel, for all of their good characteristics, balked at the concept of Moses leading them out, cried for help at the shores of the Red Sea, begged for something besides manna to eat. And Israel in their history did all sorts of things that disqualified them from being anywhere near God. This is the reason why John begins the discussion in 1 John with God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. Because that verse sets the scene and it clarifies who is on what side and who wins in the end. If God is light and sin being its contrast is darkness, then you and I have some big problems. Perhaps we've not murdered any Egyptians, but we've all done things that disqualify us from being in God's presence. We've all done something, in sometimes multiple cases, and in often multiple years of doing so. We've done things that disqualify us from dwelling with God. It says, Isaiah put it in Isaiah 59 too, your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. Your sins have hidden His face from you. God didn't hide His face and then we sinned. We sinned and then the face was hidden. God is light and in Him there is no darkness. But John is writing to a group of people that have dealt with, their, are dealing with errors concerning that relationship. Errors about one's relationship with God and our relationship with sin. The first of which is in 1 John 1 and verse 6. If we say that we have fellowship with Him, and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Many of John's readers were beginning to fall into what would become known as the Gnostic doctrines. It's not fully formed at the time of 1 John's writing, but the seeds are already planted and the thoughts are already there. One of the thoughts in that Gnostic doctrine was that the body could sin, but it did not affect the soul within. It's as if our body is the container, and the container can certainly get dirty, but the soul and the, sin, or the spirit within it would remain clean. It would remain untouched, untarnished. In essence, you could do what you please with your body. But if you were perhaps a Christian, your soul remained clean and unstained. Many today seem to be doing that same sort of thing. You get on Instagram and people are talking about their relationship with God. And just above that, their preferred pronouns. Something's off. I'm in a close, deep, committed, personal relationship with God. But my day-to-day -day actions defy everything that He says to do. 
you have your Bible, if you leave your marker there in 1 John, we're going to be back there in just a second. But look at 2 Corinthians 6. If this idea that what's done in our body is separate from our spirit and in so doing separate from our relationship with God is not something found in Scripture. Scripture seems to indicate that one's body and what one does with it affects one's soul. The two are tied together. First Corinthians, or sorry, rather, 2 Corinthians 6, look there beginning with me in verse 14. Paul tells the Corinthians, who are Christians, by the way, do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness and lawlessness? What fellowship has light with darkness? Or what harmony has Christ with Belial? Or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? Or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? Paul does here the thing that all lawyers do, which is ask questions that he knows the answers to. And all of the questions seem to have the same answer, correct? None. No righteousness and lawlessness together. No light with darkness. No Christ and a false God. No believing and unbelieving being together. Our world is inundated with people who are claiming to walk in the light of God. And instead they are walking in darkness. Paul would tell the Ephesians in Ephesians 5 and verse 11, the Ephesians who again are Christians. He would tell them in Ephesians 5 and verse 11, do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead even expose them. For it's disgraceful even to speak of the things which are done by them in secret. In a sense, our world is not worse than theirs, but in a sense it is, because in our world, everything anyone does is widely and publicly known, instantaneously around the world, by way of these things, by way of social media. Paul would tell his Christian brethren that how you walk matters, not what you claim or what you post on the internet. Of course, Paul didn't have internet, but that's another sermon. Secondly, people today, like the people of John's time, struggle with the idea that they have a problem with sin in the first place. 1 John 1 and verse 8 says, if we say that we have no sin. So that's having sin in kind of the present current sense. Not in the I've never done anything wrong, but in the I am okay as I am right now situation. If we say that we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. Again, John's readers were dealing with Gnostic heresies. Another of which is that there is grace if one has been cleansed by Jesus, if one has found grace in the eyes of God, then that there are no more sins in our lives. It's as if we are incapable of being in sin after becoming Christians. In short, since one becomes a Christian, sin ceases to be an impossibility. And if that sounds familiar, it should. There's a Calvinist slant on this as well. Ecclesiastes 7 verse 20 tells us, Indeed, there is not a righteous man on earth who continually does good and who never sins. So this idea that I'm okay, I'm just fine, I need to change nothing, is simply false. Paul would teach that Christians themselves can be in sin. And this is just one example of this in Romans 6 and verse 11. Paul, again, writing to Christians in Romans 6 and verse 11 says, Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts. And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness. But present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. Paul isn't writing to Christians who are still wet from their baptism. Okay, They're not reading Romans on the front row, we might say. He's writing to Christians, those who have been in Christ, and telling them, don't let sin reign. Don't present, don't, I love this in verse, or I don't like it, but it makes the point. In verse 13, do not go on presenting the members. So that means what? They've been presenting themselves. 
as instruments of unrighteousness. Christians can sin and be in sin. A lot of people today deny the idea that they are in sin at all. They're under the delusion that they are flawless. As you can see there with my oddly shaped characters, I'm fine just the way I am. I don't need to change anything. Me and God are like this, you know. We're good. No, no, no need to do this radical repentance stuff. No need to get too concerned about, you know, what God says. Our pride tends to overrule us when we know we need to humble ourselves and repent, confess our faults. As John says, if we say we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves. But thirdly, and similar to the second error, the third error, I think, with sin is that we get to decide whether we're in sin or not. This is different from the, from the second one. The second one denies that there is a sin problem at all, but the third one is sort of this idea that we get to decide whether or not something has been right before God. You see this all the time. This idea that God affirms my choices. What feels right to me is what is right, so I'm going to do it. Have you ever noticed that what feels right to me is right always seems to go in the direction of the person making the choice? You know? It's like if the person declares that they love cheeseburgers and it just so happens they always turn up at Burger King. Who to thunk it, you know? I'm what I'm doing is perfectly fine. No one ever comes out and says, I feel like I'm in sin before God for like no reason. But often people read in Scripture what God has said about their sin. And then convictions are made. God's word states plainly that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And if we state otherwise, we are declaring that God is a liar. As it says here in our text, if we say we've not sinned, we make him a liar. Why? Because God's word establishes what sin is. You and I don't get to make the decisions about what's sinful and what's not sinful. It bothers me so much when I see these discussions on, you know, they get the talking heads on the different shows talking about, well, should we do this or should we do that? And I'm like, none of you have any right to make that choice. As we talked about in our Bible class this morning, none of them take the book from God's right hand and open it to reveal who is to be saved and who is not to be saved. Nobody but God through his word has the right to say what sin is and isn't. God's word is as God put it in Psalm 19, verse 7. Psalm 19, not Proverbs 19, Psalm 19. Psalm 19 and verse 7, God says of his word this, The law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true. They are righteous altogether. And if you're singing the song in your head, me too, okay? That's the standard, not us. Not what we think or feel or not what we see as the majority of opinions on social media. None of that matters before the throne. What does matter is his word. So if we go back to 1 John, note what we've talked about just in the brief moment we've had. John makes the point, we all have sinned, we all have this problem, even true for Christians. Sin is that which prohibits relationship with God and as such it's something from which we need Forgiveness. That's why it's so valuable in this text to keep reading down to chapter 2. The Bible wasn't originally written with this chapter break in it, and it's an unfortunate place for this, because notice what he says next. After describing these three errors and sort of the solutions we're going to get to in a moment, he comes back to the ultimate solution in Jesus. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins... That's all of us. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Through Jesus, God reached down 
into, as we sing sometimes, this desert of sorrow and sin. He reached down with his Savior, Jesus. And he provided a way for us to be clean and forgiven and come into his presence. It's as if God let down a life rope. An opportunity for us to be clean of that which separates us from Him. We cannot overstate the importance of who Jesus is and what Jesus did, even as we talked about in our Revelation study this morning. Worthy is the Lamb. Because He's the only one that bridges that gap. The gap between us and our unholiness and God and His holiness. And He does so by cleansing us that which we've done. Jesus is the bridge between a holy God and an unholy people. And Jesus is the answer to sin that John describes in 1 John chapter 1. Come back with me, if you will, at 1 John 1 and go back to verse 7. In verse 6, if we say we have fellowship with Him and walk in the darkness, we're lying. But in verse 7, the alternative to that is Jesus and His being our advocate. If we walk in the light as He Himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus His Son cleanses us from all sin. This is the appeal that we make to God through baptism. Peter, you remember, describes baptism in 1 Peter 3 and verse 21 as an appeal to God for a good conscience. An appeal, a request that God would cleanse us from that which is destroying our conscience, making us fully aware of the fact we can't be in His presence. It's so much more than getting wet. It is a cry for help. It is a plea to God for forgiveness. It is a request, and it's one that God has graciously declared that He would fulfill if it were made through Jesus Christ. It's the reason why in Acts 2 and verse 38, Peter tells the Jews there, Repent and let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. You'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It was the jailer, wasn't it? In Acts 16, who asked the question? The question of what he needed to do? How he needed to respond? What must I do to be saved? He asked Paul and Silas. Believe in the Lord and you'll be saved, they're told. The gospel is preached to them in verse 32 of Acts 16. They're taken the same hour of the night in verse 33 and baptized. Why? Because baptism was how the Philippian jailer and all his family were going to make that appeal to God for forgiveness, for cleansing, for saving from this situation from which we can't save ourselves. If one is to address the problem of sin, they must address it God's way by obeying His gospel. Having done so, John's admonition in 1 John 1, again, is to walk in the light. Once we've made our appeal to God through baptism, we must be willing to walk as Christians in the light. To be cleansed and then to stay cleansed are two different processes. Children don't seem to understand the the difference. You wash them and it's like 10 minutes later, they're back in it, you know. There's the washing and then there's the remaining clean part. That's the part John calls us to in this chapter. Look at 1 John 1, 7 again. If we walk in the light as He Himself's in the light. In verse 9, if we confess our sins. We'll get to that in a second. Once we've made our appeal to God and we beg His forgiveness, Jesus' blood cleanses us as we walk with Him. Peter was the one who tied together repentance and baptism. Repentance, the willingness to turn away from that which got you filthy in the first place, spiritually speaking. It's a resolve to continue in cleanliness. One writer put it this way, Walking in the light is leading a life of holiness and purity. We are to be chaste, holy, exemplary people. Walking in the light is walking in the truth, opposing error and having a clear view of the truth. And walking in the light is enjoying the promises of God. Living the joy of our salvation every day. 
Walking in the light doesn't mean walking around fearful that God's going to zap us all the time. That's not the God we serve. Walking in the light also recognizes that we serve a holy God who's capable of doing so. In Ephesians 5, note this with me. When Paul would be writing to his Ephesian brethren about how they are to continue walking as beloved children in verse 1 of that chapter, Ephesians 5 and verse 7, Paul tells them this, Therefore, do not be partakers with them, for you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. John would say walk in the light, but Paul goes a step further and says you are light. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth, trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Paul admits we may not even know what all it means to live in the light yet. We may not fully realize every single moment of every single situation what we must do. But as Christians, we're expected to pursue God. Do our level best according to His Scripture to be people of the light. What happens if you do sin? John puts it simply. Confess it. Confess it before God and confess it before one another. God is faithful. He will not fail to forgive if a sin is confessed. Would that we were that faithful ourselves. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us, right? Jesus prayed and taught his disciples to do the same. You ever thought about what a small price God asks us to pay when we sin? We're not told to offer sacrifice. We're not told to do penance or to say so many prayers of a certain category. When we sin, we are told to confess that we have sinned and ask God to forgive us and then to turn away from it and walk no more in it. That's that third one that I always seem to forget. It's real easy to confess that I'm a sinner. I'm pretty messed up. That, I, I'm, I, I know that, right? I can confess that part. And it's, and it's, and it's good to, to ask forgiveness, but what about the, the turning and leaving part? If sin bothers me enough to bring it to God to forgive me, maybe it should bother me enough to turn from it and to put it behind me. He who conceals his transgressions will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will find compassion. Proverbs 28 and verse 13. He who confesses and forsakes them will find compassion. To do all of these things, you need Jesus. If you intend to dwell in the light where God is, you need Jesus because He's the source of it. He is the light. To be free of the lies that we've told ourselves and be free of the lies that other people tell us in regard to sin, you need Jesus. He is the way and the truth and the life. Remember? It's only in Jesus and His Gospel and His Word that we're going to find the freedom that we want from these things. To have the life that Jesus promises, you must turn to Him. Often I make invitations just too complicated. Invitations aren't complicated. They really consist of whether or not a person needs three things. My question to you is, what do you need to do and how can we help you? I know it's not very pretty sounding, but it is what it is. What do you need? Do you need to come to Jesus and obey His gospel message? We can help you with that. If you're not even sure what that means, we can help you with that too. But if you know what it is, you know what you need to do. John begged his readers to turn to the light. To renounce their walking in darkness. To have fellowship with God. To be clean of sin. To be the person God wants you to be. And that's the same thing we want for all of you. Perhaps you are like John's readers. Perhaps you are a Christian, yet you've been carried away by these different mistakes. These different ways of looking at things. You've taken a little more time on social media, listened to a few more people that deserve zero of our attention. It's okay to say you've messed up. It's not okay to continue as if everything's fine. Maybe you need to come back to Jesus. You need to be restored to Him. 
begging his forgiveness. Maybe you need help in your walk. Maybe you're not separate, you're just struggling. You need the prayers of us. We'll offer those for you. Because we all understand how difficult it is to walk in the light. We all need Jesus as our advocate. If we were all perfect, we wouldn't need Jesus. But because we're not all perfect, we definitely need him. Can we help you this morning? If we can, during the song we're about to sing, if you come down to the front, let one of us know, we'll do just that. All right, let's stand and let's sing. If we can help you, let us know.